Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is Don Anderson, aka The Lone Star, NMLS 1946644. As you guys know, I'm a licensed mortgage loan originator slash mortgage broker servicing Arizona, California, Georgia, Florida, and the great state of Texas. Now guys, today's video, I wanted to come to you and talk to you briefly about buying a house or an ugly house in a nice neighborhood now you might say what is he talking about that sounds crazy well a lot of times you'll hear investors say don't go to a bad neighborhood and buy a cheap house or don't go to a great neighborhood and buy a good house because you want cash flow return on your investment but i want to spend that i want to talk about that from the perspective of a first-time home buyer someone just getting into the market someone buying a primary residence a primary residence meaning a dwelling for you your family you know to grow up in to grow your wealth to start out in so that brings me to the topic of buying an ugly home or not the nicest home but in a great neighborhood why would I do that I'll give you an example right here I'm in the great state of Texas so a lot of areas that I like that I spend a lot of time in are in South Lake, Texas, Grapevine, Texas. I spend a lot of time in Mansfield, Grand Prairie, you know, those areas. Those are my stomping grounds. That's where you'll find me most of the time. I'll go to Frisco sometimes. I'll go to Legacy. I'll go to, you know, Plano sometimes. But those really aren't my areas. A little too congested for me. But what I've noticed is how property values have boomed over time. You know, we've got people moving in, we've got changing industries coming, we've got tech coming, we've got incomes growing, households growing, so income levers have grown in each of these specific areas. Now, what's grown with it, you know, with inflation, is the value of the properties, the homes. Now, in those areas, everything isn't a big, fancy seven, eight hundred thousand dollar house, million dollar house. You know, when we talk about South Lake and Grapevine, we can go all the way up to, you know, $10 million even more in the value of home that you may find. Um, you know, same for Mansfield. You may go up to five, six, seven million dollars. But once upon a time, homes in those areas were starter homes. They were houses priced at maybe a hundred thousand dollars not too long ago less than five six years ago you have had homes at that price point but are now selling for nearly half a million dollars because what has happened is the area has always been nice good schools low crime people seeking to be there those areas are now building up more and people are still coming in and like i said the household income is growing so what's going up with it is property values now, a lot of times you see people, I know you guys follow the Instagram, the social medias, you see the hype about buying the big $700,000 house to start out with, the half a million dollar house. If you're in California, heck, your starting price, if you're in like San Diego somewhere, maybe about $800,000. That could be considered kind of a high tier starter home or seven fifty. dollars You know, in the Texas area, now that prices have went up, starter homes now you can look above like 420,000 well 380 to 420 380 to 450 really you can find that bubble of starter home um, homes and those are the upgraded homes the new construction the things with the upgraded countertops uh, the high ceilings the upgraded floors you know the, the upgraded landscaping just a bunch of different things but what if you were to buy a home let's say it was three hundred thousand dollars but it was in a neighborhood where the household annual incomes over ninety thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars where it's an up-and-coming area where there's potential growth in the homes coming up around you're all half a million and above would that be a bad decision to purchase your starter home there no it wouldn't here's why you can gut and upgrade your own house you have options. You can use different type of loan structures to do the improvements on your home. There are different things that you can do. If you got enough land, you can add a pool, make your house more attractive. The thing is, we often get carried away with the idea of what our first home is supposed to be. You know, it's just like when we go out and we buy that Mercedes for our second or our first car. 
realizing that it's parked at work all day, every day, just so we can afford to pay for it. Today's video is brought to you by two books on Amazon.com. If you're not an avid reader yourself, but you know an entrepreneur, or you know a college student, or someone trying to figure out their finances or start a business, the first book is The Assault on Middle Class America. Get your family finances in order. And the second book is Black Entrepreneur Survival Guide. Pick them up today, Amazon.com. The objective for buying a house even though I know you guys have been taught over the last two, three years that equity, 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 that's every realtor selling point. Well, this house, they bought it in 2019 and 2022, we sold it for $250,000 more than they paid for. Listen, that is a fallacy. That type of action happens once in a blue moon. Black Swan events, we had the cough, cough. Don't want to say it on the YouTube, get this video, you know, limited. But we had so many different things going on that allow historically low interest rates, which what happens when you can do get low interest rates? You can buy more. So an adverse action to that is people start selling their properties for more money because demand increased. Inventory really hasn't changed that much in the last five, six years, but demand went nuts. It went nuclear. So with demand going nuclear, there was limited capacity or limited limited uh, homes available. There was limited supply because of all the outrageous demand, which you have people paying outrageous prices, which is why you had those absorbent increases. In a realistic real estate market, you can expect three to five percent appreciation year over year, with some years remaining stagnant. That's the truth. That's how it normally works. That is, unless you buy in a dilapidated area, an area in complete chaos, then that's a different story. You're probably not going to see appreciation. I never advise anybody to do that, not even an investor. So the point is, if you buy a starter home, let's say, oh, it doesn't have the nice steel appliances, buy them. It doesn't have the nice what do they call it? Lighting, because now everybody uses all the white paint. They've gotten away from the dark countertops. They've gotten away from the dark flooring. Maybe it has carpet. Do it yourself. Maybe it doesn't have that fourth bedroom or that entertainment room or that in-law suite. Build it yourself. Disclaimer, get the proper approval from your local state legislature about building, but do it yourself. You see, a home is what you make it. The thing about a home is it's supposed to provide stability, security, stability again, and the last thing you should be thinking about is how rich your house is going to make you. The house makes you wealthy by one, buying into it correctly and not spending more than your budget, not being house poor. Two, by again allowing you in the future possibly to tap into equity if it's available to possibly pay off debt, send a child to college, pay for your own higher education, start a business, different things like that if it increases in enough equity. But typically when you're talking a decade, 15 years before you see the type of equity, equity we saw in the last three years. Another thing a house can do for you, you're starting out with your family. Maybe you're an empty nester. No, not an empty nester, but you're starting out with your family. Maybe you're a young couple. You buy the house in the nice neighborhood. Your income rises over time because most people improve in life. Whether you get a new skill set, you find a new job, your spouse gets a raise, you guys get a doctorate, more education. You typically grow in income in the future. So what do you do with the house that you have? No, you don't sell it to get the equity. You rent that beautiful house out in that beautiful neighborhood and you get top dollar. Because if you're doing it after 10 years, even five years, you've paid some of the principal down or you've at least paid much of the taxes down. But rents continue to rise. And if it's in a wonderful, desirable area, you have the opportunity, the opportunity to make some income. Worst case scenario, break even. You may say, well, why would I do that? Why not break even and keep an asset? Because remember, even though the focus isn't to worry about the equity, the equity still could and possibly will grow over time. 
So if you have, you're able to have an asset that continues to grow over time, rents eventually do increase everywhere because the cost of everything goes up, you have to increase rents. It is what it is. Then you have your property and you can continue to grow. Then the next property that you have, maybe two, three, five years, you've outgrown that property. Maybe that's the big boy $500,000 house, the $600,000, $700,000 house. Maybe you're above that one. Or maybe you're downsizing and it's time for a condo. That's now an, another massive property that you have that you can rent out, that you can do different things with. If Airbnb is still around, you can Airbnb. Vacation rentals. There are so many different things that you can do by starting small. You know, I talk to applicants every day, borrowers, people getting ready to purchase, as well as realtors every day. And the main thing that always comes up is, I don't want to start with this level of house. The issue is, in many cases, especially with the higher interest rate, that's the level you should start at. Let's try to get out of this mentality that we have to do it for the gram. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. I don't have to explain it. Everybody's showing them standing in their fancy driveway. Hell, you don't even know if it's really their driveway. Washing their car or smiling. Funny, they're never in the house. They're always either standing in front of the garage or the front door. That's another story. Nevertheless, understand, your home is what you make it. Safety, security, stability, future asset to generate income, possible equity in the, in the far future, in a real cycle. Think about what purchasing a home means to you. Think about that apartment that you lived in for five years that they haven't updated anything. You're still paying higher rent. A lot of times we get a little too fancy when we have an opportunity. Back when I was in the car business, we used to call it the big chest syndrome. When you tell a borrower they were approved, they get a big chest and say, well, I want the Bentley. They may make $40,000 a year. It's human nature. It's the human disposition. We always want a little more because we feel like we can handle a little more until that bill comes due. Think about what I'm telling you. The starter home. Buy the ugly home in the nice neighborhood. Listen, when I say ugly home in the nice neighborhood, I don't mean it's falling apart. It just may not be as updated as the rest. But only you pay your payment and have your true future plan. Let's stop doing everything in microwave bursts. Let's stop looking for the dopamine hit. Buying a home is not meant to be a dopamine hit. And I know it's hard, but take the emotions out of it. Because you're going to buy, after you buy one, and let's say you're 40, 30, you'll probably buy at least five more properties. It just is what it is. Don't get tied down. Don't get too attached because things change, as you know. Thank you guys for tuning in. You stayed this long. I know a lot of you watch the videos. You don't leave a like and you don't subscribe. Please subscribe to the channel. Help your boy out. Until next time, I will talk to you soon.